So you can always find something to complain about, but I'm like, I woke up this morning, I'm like, thank you, God, that this was this Sunday and wasn't last week. Let's have an awesome time this morning.
Yeah. 
That's a lot of people, isn't it? Do you realize how, how high a number over 8 billion is? And not just out of sheer stubbornness, not out of just sheer pride do I make this statement. Not one of the 8 billion people in this world can sway me can talk me out of what I know in God. I will readily tell people I'm as dumb as a box of rocks about a lot of different issues in this life. I am. I know I am. But when it comes to what I know in God, how can I, a recipient of four miracle healings in my personal life, how could I ever say that we serve a God that doesn't heal and perform great miracles? How could I ever say that? How could I ever say that God isn't real and our God isn't powerful and his kingdom is a kingdom of righteousness? How can I say that unless I know what I know, what I know in God? And I love you folks. You're my church family. I love you to pieces. But not one of you can come even close to talking me out of what I know and what I have experienced in my God. And I don't care how many Muslims. I don't care how many Hindus. I don't care how many Buddhists. I don't care how many people of the over 8 billion people in this world will try to come my way and tell me that there is not a wonderful, powerful, loving, merciful, compassionate God that we serve. Are, are you that uh, confident? Are you that assured in your faith toward God that you're bold enough to just let the world know I serve a God who's alive. He is not dead, but he is alive forevermore. I know last Sunday was uh, Resurrection Sunday morning, but a week later, I still say that he has risen forevermore. He's alive. You take, the, you take Muhammad, he didn't 
rise from the dead. You take Buddha. Buddha is still in the grave. You take all of the other gods. You take all the other dictators that ever lived down through time. They're still in the grave. We serve the only one who has risen. He's alive forevermore. If Sean's like me, he's had several weeks for the word to kind of give him the itch and burn in his heart so Sean come up and share God's word with us. Good morning. Good morning. Man, Richard's getting us on our feet, ready to, ready. you know what though, just coming through Resurrection Sunday and I'm um, I, always mindful of what we just went through and so I, I appreciate that Richard because I was actually still on my heart even, in, you know, things are still, a lot of things were going on because of Easter Sunday and all things, uh, the, even music I was listening to this morning, there was still a lot of stuff, so much from last week that's still spilling over and um I just can't get out of my head. Lately, my, you know, you spend your own time study. Lately, I've been listening to some Billy Graham, you know, and just uh, some of those messages he did back in the decades ago, even. I mean, and, and he just had such a simplistic message, and especially with what we just went through. Our God's not a God of the dead. He's a God of the living, and he's the one that's worth serving in the midst of everything. And, uh, and I don't know, this is kind of another... I'm just thinking about you know the world and and living life and and yes, obviously I, I I probably had this message two weeks ago or better you know and I always spend time on it the day before where I really try to focus my efforts but um, there's just so much when it comes to living this life with our God and and if I could you know if I could give you a theme of Sean's ministry if you want to refer to it as that. The thing that always I and that's why I was listening to Billy Graham some this week and it's like he never strayed no matter what topically he was bringing up at any given time he came back to Jesus Christ and him crucified as the centerpiece of and it's the foundation it's what sets us apart from maybe other religions the way we view the world and our spiritual framework but it it boils down to this and I always i like to boil things down get right down in the road where we all live and breathe is that god is that i'm a he's a very present help in time of trouble what does that mean it means all during the week when things are tough that there's something there that there's it's more than just these are more than words on a page these are more than especially when you think about how long they've survived this story why are we still talking about this story? And maybe this will become part of it. Sorry, Richard, you got me off on a tangent. I'm just on this kick. I've been lately, I don't know why, when you think about the Resurrection Sunday. And you know, those of us as Christians, we might say, I can enjoy Halloween, but people will say, oh, Halloween's the devil's holiday. Well, well it's just to focus on death, and that's fine. And we still bring life out of death. But this ho what holiday, if you want to call it, this, this celebration, this acknowledgement, which can be in our hearts all year long, is simply showcasing to us where we are, that we fell, and that he made a way where there seemed to be no way in the midst of it. That is good news. They talk about it being the good, good news. So I'm with you, Richard. I could, I could sit up here and bring another Easter message, and we could just get going, and that would be... But that wasn't my focus this morning. I do have something to get us, keep us... Uh, where we need to be, but I did bring something funny. Would you, you guys would be like, if Sean didn't bring something funny, everybody'd be like, what in the world? What's going on with him? But um, I thought these were kind of cute in light of Lexi's always telling us stories related to school. These are school excuses, and many of them were written by the children thinking they could get away with it instead of their parents. But there's just a few of these, and people can be very colorful. Please excuse John for being absent on January 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33 also. <laughs> I think John had a hand in that excuse. Um, please excuse Roland from PE for a few days. Yesterday he fell out of a tree and misplaced his hip. Um, let's see. 
Carlos was absent yesterday because he was playing football. He was hurt in the growing part. <laughs> um, Megan could not come to school today. She has been bothered by very close veins. Uh, Chris will not be in school today. He has an acre in his left side. Somebody didn't get that the <laughs> written in correct. Please excuse Ray from school. He has very loose bowels. <laughs> Good. And if anything, this, please excuse Jimmy for being, I think they meant sick. It was his father's fault. And somebody just saying to take a shot. I had a whole bunch of these. Um, Sally won't be in school from Friday. We have to attend her funeral. I mean, a funeral, I think. Anyway, th these go on and on. There's some really good ones here. but um, We can all try to get out of our responsibilities by coming up with a good excuse. That wasn't even my topic this morning. I just thought that was kind of fun. I do want to ask this rhetorical question this morning, and I love this, this part of Scripture, but my, my point to each one of you, we're going to talk about this as we, in a little bit of time that we have. I want to ask this question. Who do you say that I am? So when I... When I think about that phrase, and I want to take you to that, obviously, three of the four Gospels record this story. And it's interesting. You know, I've heard people criticize in, uh, the book, the Bible, and they'll say, oh, you know what? Especially the Gospels. You've got four Gospels that are written there. They don't always line up. So see, the Bible's got inconsistencies. And I'm like, wait a second. To me, it makes it that much more valid. We've been watching detective shows and some lately, and, you know, they're always trying to follow the evidence and all this stuff. But you think about it, if you have something happen and you're looking for eyewitness accounts, what strengthens the eyewitness account? Oh, I saw that too. Oh, I saw that too. So is it wrong when one of them didn't note that, but three do, or four do, or one does, whatever? No, it was their perspective. That's what's so unique about the Bible. Here was four independent people brought that, that they, they brought that knowledge and that experiential base through years of transcribing it from verbal to written. And here we have it today. We have four different, completely different eyewitness accounts. I cannot believe how well they mesh and line up. To me, that gets me excited because I'm thinking, man, follow the evidence. Here's what we've got. But I'm going to take you specifically to Mark 16 and 15. And Jesus asked this question. Who do you say that I am? And I'm going I'm to step this through a minute. And, and the, the part that I think I want to bring up to all of us today is how would you respond if Jesus asked you this today? And keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to this. And you know the words, great teacher, religious leader, humanitarian. And, and I, I love this. C.S. Lewis, I've been a, um, a fan of C.S. Lewis writings for a while. I wrote most of them back in the 40s and, and earlier. But uh, he, he made this comment out of one of his books, one of my favorite books, Mere Christianity. He wrote this. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. C.S. Lewis recognized that Christ is far more than a great moral teacher. Christ, as revealed in Scripture, is the Holy Son of God. And I know Josh McDowell, there's those books, More Than a Carpenter, and there's multiple people that have written kind of an account that way, that don't let anybody ever back you in a corner and say, yeah, Jesus was a good moral, good teacher. Like, no. We've had lots of great teachers that we don't talk about thousands of years later, Right? He either said things that were controversial. Oh, and did he say things controversial, or was he just a good moral teacher? No, it got him killed. <laughs> I think what he was saying had a bite to it. And what did Jesus say about his own words? I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword, division. The things I say are going to cause division. Why? Not because I'm trying to cause discord, but because my words, being weighty, are going to cut to the heart. Just like that sword that can carve through joints and marrow and things like that. It, they're going to have substance to them. So, so I do want to take you, let's, let's go backwards a little. Mark 16, we're going to do it at 13. 
So Christ asked the disciples, right, who do people, you notice how, that's how he actually started. He started, so, folks, you know, his faithful few, right, he's going to the disciples. What are people saying about me? Who, who do people, what do they say about the Son of Man? And then they started responding. You know, John the Baptist, again, equating him to something great, great more teacher, maybe Elijah or Jeremiah, some prophet. And so what is the reasoning from that? The impact Jesus was having, obviously people were not able to simply dismiss him and his words. The, the impact he was already making, something special about this gentleman, something special about what he's doing in people's lives. There's no negating the, what he, they could see. It was evidential. It was in front of them. They could see everything happening. And as they answer and they finish that discussion, then he makes it very pointed and he goes right to the root of the matter. But who do you say that I am? He made it personal. He made it something very direct. He put them on the spot, so to speak. Does anybody like to be put on the spot? Sometimes you're like, you ever remember that in school? And you're like, oh, hope he don't call on me. Hope he doesn't call on me. I don't know this one. I don't know. <laughs> and you're like, hey, Sean, what do you think? Um, <laughs> like, I don't know if I want to answer. Because what happens when you put on the spot? You've got to put into words what you know to be the answer to that subject. And that's why it's interesting that Jesus phrased it like, you know, who, what are people saying about me? And so it was easier for that discussion. It was easier to answer. And, and I, I almost put it this way. When it comes to our Christian walk, our Christian example, it's easy to be in Sunday school and think of, if we know enough of the word, to be saying things that we know sound right. Meaning, oh, here's the right words out of the Bible. Here's the right thing to say. And maybe we can apply that to situations in our life. It's a much different proposition for the Savior of our soul to to look right through the heart of the matter, cut out all the fray and the noise, and look right to you and in your heart and say, but who do you say that I am? Who am I to you? Where am I? Where are we together? Where are we? Where do we stand? You ever said that, had that phrase with a friend, a close confidant? Somebody might put you on the spot and say, where do we stand? Where's our relationship at? What? Give me a litmus test or a benchmark to see what happens. And here's what's so interesting. I, I will touch on Peter's response. Of course, everybody's, I'm sure there was a pause after Jesus made that comment. Because everybody is feeling a bit cut to the heart. Like, whoa, I don't know. I don't know what he's trying to say here. I've said what I thought he wanted to hear. But he's asking something more important, more personal, more deep. And Peter comes out with it and we all know this phrase you're the messiah the son of the living god the messiah the one that was set apart not just not just an answer but something special something why was that so hard and if i take you back in time in that context they were looking for the messiah at that time remember people had knew the old testament i won't spend time in that this morning people knew what the prophecies were foretold the one coming the one to save them from their trouble. The problem is, in the midst of their trouble, they weren't feeling saved. So here's this Jesus on the scene. He's healing people. He's raising the dead. He's doing wonderful things. But yet they may still be in struggle themselves. How many of us have felt like we're right there? We're in the middle of difficulty. And yet, in the midst of that, you think, well, there's a Savior coming. I do have hope. I'm hanging on to hope. But I still don't see it yet. I love that the song, um, uh, Danny Goki. I love, he's a good artist. I like hearing a lot of his songs. And he has this song, he, it's called, I Just Haven't Seen It Yet. And the question is kind of like, kind of the, the point of hope. What is hope? That thing that I can't see, but I'm yearning and longing for. Why? Because there's a basis in me that gives me something to drive toward hope. Hope gives me a future. Hope gives me something. It gives me purpose. And so when Jesus was asking them, okay, you can say what you think I want to hear, but I'm driving to the heart of the matter. And, and Peter said, you're the, you're the Christ. Something's different here. And what was it about Peter that recognized that different? And, and that's what I love about Peter. So many good stories about Peter. He would boldly go any direction. You know, the, the, the phrase where it was like, 
I'm going to wash you. And Peter's like, heck no, you're not washing me. And he's like, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. Oh, well then wash all of me. And Savior, you know, I just, I love Peter's exuberance. But yet in that, Peter was also attentive. He was tuned in. You know what I'm talking about? When you're on the radio, you don't have it quite tuned in. It's scratchy and scratch. You know, trying to get it back where you need to go. New radios are click, click. They're not quite so, you know, like the old dial. But you could just tune. You could hear it come right. Boom. There it is. It's now it's clear. Folks, sometimes when we hear that phrase, my sheep know my voice, sometimes we've got to tune in to God in order to know what the Spirit's saying to us. Sometimes when it talks about a whisper or a still small voice, can you hear? And, and this is this morning's discussion is not on prayer, but I would ask you this question. I can ask me this question. Are we tuned in enough that prayer is not one way? Is prayer two way with you? Or is it all <laughs> what, what psychologists like to say verbal vomit? Is it all bail me out? Here's what's wrong. Fix me. Help me. Or is there a, wait, i got to get tuned in so I can hear expressly what the Spirit's saying. So I can know what it is that you're trying to tell me and help me. And Peter, in his humbleness, was, after the quiet and the stillness of all the other disciples, not wanting to stick their necks out or, or even really understand. Again, we read this and we know, oh yeah, he's Jesus. We, we read the Bible, when we start reading the Bible as kids, we know the end of the story. They didn't know the end of the story. They just knew the Old Testament prophecies of someone coming. Can you imagine walking with Jesus and being like, I thought the Messiah, when I read the Old Testament, I'm thinking it's the guy on the white horse with the flaming sword and the minion, uh, armies of angels and knocking out my problems. Or Caesar. Or whatever would have been at their time, right? In context. Can you imagine being in that company? Watching those things but thinking and doubting like all of us do. Is this really the one? Is this him? It, why do you think it was so easy for them to say, maybe you're John the Baptist, maybe you're Elijah, maybe. But it took Peter to cut to the heart of the matter and say, wait a second. Mm -mm. Something's deeper going on here. You're the Christ. You're the, you're the one, the covering that would come and save us from ourselves. That broken, fallen state that it, it's hard to, to acknowledge this brokenness, but there's still, he, what's he do in this, in our broken state? And I, I know this, is, this morning's discussion is not the why do bad things happen to good people, but it, yet it bears on our human existence because it bared on them. They wanted someone to come rescue them from their situation and maybe themselves. And in the difficulty, that's when we've got to look and we've got to acknowledge in ourselves to be tuned in enough to know you're the Christ. And that means that there's something special that's coming from you. That the deliverer will give me beauty for my ashes. That in the midst of a difficult, dark time, you are my savior. You are the risen king that's coming. So when I think of that, Many times, I love that phrase, that uh, song, Brandon Heath, I think, when it's, give me your eyes. We did a, me, a mime on it from the youth at one point. But I, I, many times, we have to have a new vision. It's kind of like the glasses that I put off going to get for so long, I still don't like to wear. <laughs> but you know what? I'll be struggling, especially in low light, and I'm like, and I'm looking, one eye's better than the other, so I'm like, oh, that eye's okay, this, oh, not so much. And, and I'm trying, I'm struggling, and it's like you put them on, and I'm like, whoa, who turned on the lights? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't the lights. What was it? My broken, fallen state means I'm not seeing clearly, and I think I am. Or I'm too stubborn. I can step on my toes for all of you, okay? I'm too stubborn to want to look through something that will give me better vision and clarity. I need a lens, folks. I need a lens that lets me see through the situation and say, yeah, we're hearing you're a great teacher, the Elijah prophets whatever but no I, I hear it because i see clearly you are the christ and i didn't need to know that because you fixed all my situations i know that because you're the one worth following you're the one that gives me a way where there seems to be no way do you see why these scriptures make sense when you actually rubber meets the road when you actually have to live life we all encounter hardship man is few days and full of trouble <laughs> I mean, we don't even 
we don't get just a few days on this life and we're already struggling. Like we've been having baby goats at home. It's kidding time. And oh, I love it when they hit the ground and they're running and they know what to do with their thing. But they don't always do that. Sometimes they need a little boost to get them going the right direction. And I've had one this weekend. I've been lovingly and carefully giving it time and attention. And I just picture my Heavenly Father being like, I would not make it if he didn't give me those gentle nudges and that little bit of boost of nutrient I need. A little bit of nutrient boost I need to get myself going in the right direction so I can drink from the word and I can start with milk and it can graduate to solid food and I can grow and develop in him because no matter how difficult life gets, no matter how fuzzy it looks, if I can just put on the glasses and get new vision, I'll recognize perspective that is beyond any comprehension. It's the perspective that Peter had in the midst of that situation to say, wait a second. I'm not just seeing, I don't need Caesar to be out of my way and my personal situation fixed to recognize you're the one. You're the one that's coming to save us from ourselves and give us the direction that we need in the midst of time. So, you know, um, and I love this, in our identity, being hid in Christ, I love 1 Peter 1 and 16, Called, Christ calls us to be obedient children who have been ransomed from death to new life. You know, Richard, I didn't even really think about this being an Easter message until I'm going through it now. And I'm like, man, this is a total follow on Easter message. And I wasn't even, I didn't mean it because I put this together before Easter. So just so you know. But he, call, he created us. We've been a ransomed from death into life. What does that mean? He paid, we were held captive. By our sins, by our human nature, by all these things that we can lament if we want. But the point is, when you're in them, what do you need? I want saved. Someone needs to pay my ransom and save me from my captors. Right? We hear that on the news. You're like, what's it going to take to get that person out of captivity? Well, oh, that's so difficult to have to pay that ransom and set someone free. But Jesus did it willingly. Willingly. He willingly put on flesh, became man, dwelt among us, went to the cross, and took our place. The propitiation. That's a, if you want to spend time studying this week, look up that word, propitiation. He became for us what we deserved in our frailty, in our fallen nature and state. I think, folks, I think I identify more with Paul as time goes on and the more I walk with God because Paul would say things like this. And it, I always remember reading this thinking, man, Paul, you're kind of self-debasing. Like, he would say, I'm the chiefest among sinners. I, I wish you'd spoke with heavenly languages more. I speak more than you all. And he would say things like that. And I'm thinking, man, Paul, you wrote most of the New Testament. We're all following your words as an example of Christ and, and Christ-filled words and pages. And Yet you're so, you're humbling yourself so much in front of us. Why? No, I, God's been teaching me as we walk along this journey together. The more I recognize my own fallen nature, the more I realize how much I need him. And then it just becomes that much more of a reality, what he really did for me. He gave all for me. And, and then what I feel like, what's my, my offering back to him? It's a token of what he gave to me. So when you look at times and situations in life and the struggles we go through, it doesn't make light of any of it. It's just this recognition, this vision to get rid of the stubbornness, if you will, and acknowledge, wait a second, give me your eyes, Lord, so I can see clearly and I can see you through it. I got a, The girls gave me a picture in another Peter story. It's the one where he lost sight of Jesus and went under the waves, right? We know that. I didn't look that up this morning. But I'm just thinking of this and mindful of this, that... He got out of the boat, right? He got out acknowledging a supernatural part of his Savior. Bid me come out. Give me the, the unction. I'm, I'm, I'm on it. And he did. He was successful because it wasn't him. But what happened? We know the story. He took his eyes off Christ. And then he starts falling under. By his own problems, by his own difficulties, by his own circumstances. He was falling under the waves. And I have that picture the girls got me, and it actually gives me a lump when I see that picture, and that's why I love it so much that I've got hanging down in our, my room downstairs. 
And it's that picture of Jesus looking through the water, putting his hand down to us. And I, I love that picture because it's just, I see myself. It, he's, he's right there. And he's seeing through my destructive situation that I've caused for myself. And yet still extending a hand with a loving face. Give me your hand and I'll pull you up out of the dark, miry clay that you find yourself in. And pull you back out on the solid ground once again. I'll do that for you again. We just have to know who he is and know how to respond to that. That identity being hid in Christ. What does that mean? It means I don't have to give in to the emotion, to the difficulty, to the challenge that's around me. You ever seen that meme that's been going around the internet right now? It's not the water. Um, it's not the water around the boat that sinks it. It's the water that gets in the boat, right? It's when we allow our circumstances to overwhelm us is when we're no longer buoyant through the storm. When we no longer see the way through it. You might think, I just want out of the storm. But you don't realize you're in a boat that can handle it. You can navigate the waters as long as they don't get in you. So it's okay that you're in a storm. It's okay that we're on this side of the Red Sea. We may not be able to see the way through. But if we can acknowledge that God has put something in our pathway that he can do a miracle for us in the midst of anything, it's just simply acknowledging that question to us that comes, goes right to the heart. Who do you say that I am? Meaning, who am I to you? How am I real to you in the midst of the difficulties you face? Who am I really to you? Because, to be very honest, we can all talk a good game when we come in church. It's kind of like, you know, you get in the situation, we know what the right things to say are. It's a different matter to go back out tomorrow or any time else and live life and acknowledge that he is still more than able. When everything comes calling, when the family situations pop up, when the work stuff's coming, and here comes the boss, and everything goes like this, and you feel it. Can you feel it on your back sometimes? Like, mm, feels weighed down, or, or you're in bed, and you're getting ready to get up, and you're like, do you know what I have to do today? But you know what? It could be that acknowledgement of, wait, he's with me. He's more than able. He is the Christ. Why isn't he with me today in the midst of this difficulty? How it's that question of if I'm hid in him, I love this, Philippians 1 and 6. God promises to complete the good work he has begun in us. You know, there are many times any of us can suffer from an insecurity that people aren't there for us or God's not there for us. Or maybe we feel like shaken in our faith and others. But I love this phrase that God promises to complete the good work he's begun in you, already begun. Meaning it's already in motion. You may think, I don't know that I feel like God's working on my behalf. But if you're honest, you can go back and say, wait, I remember when he was good to me here. And I remember when he was good to me here. And I remember when he was good to me here. And then it's, it becomes very much a situation where you, like David, can say, wait a second. Wait a second. Get your bearings about you. Acknowledge who you are in Christ. And say, Wait, who is Goliath, this Philistine in front of me that's defying the armies of the living God when he already delivered me from the lion and the bear? Who's this problem think he is? I already had that discussion, right? A few weeks back, I've been on this kick. These, these hallmark of faith gentlemen that could stand up, and women, that could stand up and do such wonderful things, not because of them, but because of him, because of his might and because of what he did through them and, and to them, and in the midst of everything. So, that personal question. And, and I, I like this too. I would say, as I'm thinking about this, another part that what Jesus did this, when he asked them this question, it was actually a turning point in his teaching ministry. It was up until that time he was doing lots of teaching and giving them some guidance. But it was the first time he put them on the spot. Like I was talking about the teacher scenario. I want you to answer up. You're following me, I'm teaching you, I'm guiding you. But it, he was given a foreshadow of there will be a time coming where I'll be in you, I'll be sending the comforter, the holy one that is in you, but I won't be physically with you. And that's okay, because I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. I've given you all the tools you need to be successful, and I will be with you even to the end of the age. 
He's not leaving or forsaking us. I mean, all these scriptures start, do you see how they all just kind of go like this when you start looking at the scriptures in total? If that all is true, then how come he's not enough when I'm suffering through one problem that's in front of me? When he's been good before, he'll be good again, if we're honest enough to acknowledge that. Then why isn't he good enough today? And he'll put you on the spot and say, in the midst of that time, who do you say I am? Not for the church, not for your friends, not for your peers, not for your family. Who do you say God is? Is he enough? Is he there for you? Is he the one that we can acknowledge sets us apart, gives us that? And I, I like that, um, I, I wrote down that phrase, kind of back to my the Hebrew children example. I will not be shaken. There's got to be a part of you, like Peter, that has to rise up and say, this may be controversial, this may go against the grain, but you're the Christ. And did you notice that Jesus' response to Peter? Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, Peter. You didn't just hear this on the street. People may have been talking about the Messiah, but most people were talking about they were afraid to go there. He Maybe he's a prophet, maybe he's this or that. They were afraid to go there. Folks, people in your lives will try to, people will try to get you to acknowledge maybe God's just a whatever. Maybe he's not really. Maybe he's not the one, the Holy One of old. Not the one that can set you apart. And this question comes out, can you trust him to really know him? Can you trust God to come in and be that one that is more than enough? That, that springing up of living water. He said it this way, more than one. I had written down the phrases in two different ways. Yeah, I, I, here's one of them. He, Jesus talked about, I'm the bread of life. Then he talked about being the living, and he said, he who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. I'm this water. When he said those things, he gave people physical things to grasp onto. And many people were like, oh, it's the Big Mac that never goes away. I just keep turning and biting and it, uh, that'd be cool, right? <laughs> and, we, and he actually did that with the feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000. You know, he did that. He gave them supernatural supply and showed them. And yet we get to the who do the people say I am and who do you say I am. They had already been through those experiences. That's why I talk about this is a turning point in his ministry because he was putting them on the spot for what their ministries were going to look like. And I would say the same thing to each one of you and out there as well. God is putting you in play. He's putting you in play. He's pulling you out off the bench and putting you in play. It's time to answer the call to say, who do you say that I am? Because what he's doing is he's putting an inner call in you to acknowledge if, you can, if I can be more than enough for you, you'll see what I can do through you. All these talks about your time, talents, and the gifts, and abilities, and callings. And I'm a big fan of everything like that because, again, I go back to that boiled down point and perspective that is if God didn't need me why am I here I'm simple enough to ask that question because he could use someone else that's more eloquent more talented more whatever than me but I'm still here you're still here why because there's something you have to contribute you're special you're different you're the Bible says set apart set apart before you were born I knew you what if that what's that mean it means there's something that he's got in mind for you that's going to keep you and sustain you. So give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean? Because I need him every single day of my life. It's not enough. It's not enough to pray and come to church on Sunday morning and check it off the list and assume that's going to sustain me when things get tough. Because they will. They will come. They will come with a vengeance and they'll, they'll put us on the spot and they'll do what they, need, they do to us on a regular basis. And the point is, what resource do we have? What tools do we have? I wanted to read this little bit here. This is kind of my final, final thing. Some time ago, and back to this story of Christ, because there are those that would acknowledge, and this is going to be my hearkening back to the resurrection piece again, is those that would say, you know, Jesus, whatever. But again, we're still talking about him. He's not, if he was a one-hit wonder, it, we'd be done. We'd have been done with it long ago. But Bono, the singer from uh, U2, got, and he's never been any kind of outspoken Christian ever, right? I don't think so, that he's ever come out like that. He got put on the spot on the subject of Jesus in some 
uh, interview came up. And Bono, a secular person, comes back and says, you know, the secular response to Jesus is always like this. He's a great prophet, obviously an interesting guy, along the lines of other prophets, Elijah, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, like Richard was talking about. But Bono said this, but actually Christ says, no, I'm not saying I'm a teacher. Don't call me a teacher. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm God in the flesh. I am the very one that can help you through. Bono is one saying this. He acknowledged what the word said enough to know, uh uh, he's not just the guy on the hanging on the picture. We like to see Jesus like this, you know, really pious. Some, some people have that in their church and stuff like that. He said, No, please don't just be a prophet. A prophet we can take. You could be a bit eccentric. We've had a John the Baptist eating locusts and wild honey. We can handle that, but not the Messiah. Because, you know, we're going to have to crucify you if you say that. And again, I, there's, there's, I loved reading the excerpt of this as he kind of acknowledged this piece. But even Bono was one to willingly acknowledge, no, there's something different about this guy. He did actually made the comment, why are we still talking about him? Why is he still controversial today? Why is the very mention of him cause either joy or division? Right? Why does that happen that way? And, and the reason I'm bringing that up as a hearkening from Resurrection Sunday that we just came through is because if he is what he said he was, and if he's who he said he is, that when he asks you the question, who do you say that I am, that inward acknowledgement of you with your maker, with the one that saved your soul, is what's going to set you on a different path. Set your feet. Lord, give me a light lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When we see the darkness knowing that there's someone there that can shine that light and teach us the way we should go in all certainty. He, I like this. So imagine some of, and I like this comment. This is kind of, I guess, what I want to finish with. If, yeah, I think I'm going to end it right here then. If Jesus, we can, we can create a, a narrative of Jesus. People can create one for you. People can tell you what church is all about. You can think you know what church is all about based on how you've lived life or haven't and you can go all the way through your existence until you get to this point the rubber meets the road and yet when I look at my life system my my worldview everything that I have within me and everything that's in front of me where I'm going my hopes dreams and everything that I bring along with me my human persona I have to acknowledge that one that looks right through cuts through the heart looks right into my very soul and asks me who, who, who am I to you? That if my heart can yield, that's what that surrender looks like. That yieldedness that God, it may look scary. It may look, it may look difficult because it's going to be a bit of letting go of control. We've talked about this so many times, but this is what God's been teaching me as I've walked this journey with him. That I get more authority the more I surrender control. That is a very not intuitive way it seems like to live life. And you might think, but I want to know my way around my surroundings. I want to get arms around them. I want to hang on to things, and I want to be firmly in control and have my hands on the wheel. And the whole time, God's like, who am I to you? Because when you can acknowledge me and have that surrender, that moment of allowing him to be real for us, then we can put him in the throne of our hearts and allow him to take that place that no one else can take. Pray with me this morning, Lord. I just thank you for your goodness and your blessings this morning. Lord, you are a good God. In the midst of all our difficulty and our trials and our strains and our things that take us away from you, ultimately, and you come calling just like a teacher in the classroom. And we may even want to say, don't pick me, God. I don't know how I would answer that question. But yet you still come. It's graduation day where you can say, who do you say that I am? Don't give me the words you think I want to hear. I want to know a heart's cry from you that who I am is real to you. And if I'm not there, if I'm not the Christ, if I'm not the center of your life, Lord, help us find that yieldedness and that surrender that it takes to put you firmly in control to where you can finally, finally have your way with us and our situation. And our. it's when the situation is, that's when the storm, peace be still, can truly 
we can find that resolve, Lord, that peace that passes understanding. I'm going to give you the praise and glory this morning for your goodness, which does pass our mentality to comprehend. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.